morning everyone and uh, welcome to the conference and uh, uh, thanks to Ali for the generous introduction. Uh, let me see if I can do justice to you first thing in the morning. So uh, I actually, uh, nowadays I believe a lot in speaking or writing less actually. So you will see my slides, this is the maximum amount of text on each slide. Uh, I'm putting it up on slide share so uh, you can uh, look it up later on. So when I gave the topic initially, I said people, or I, sorry, I said HR issues in agile transformation. And I thought about it and I said a lot of words are not needed in this. So I removed a lot of words and I am just going to talk about people in agile. Right? Does that sound better? Yes. Right? How many of you hate HR here? I see only two hands going up. I don't think anybody Is it an HR conference? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone from HR? I thought everyone from, was from HR. <laughs> Shouldn't that be the case, sir? Yeah. Everyone should be from HR, right? 20 years back, we used to ask, ask the question, how many of you are from quality? And we used to see only three hands going up. <laughs> and it was the same thing, right? All of us are from quality and as, as much as, as all of us are people, right? I mean, we are not robots sitting in the office. We are not furniture or flower pots who are sitting in the office. We are people. And the first thing that we need to understand is Agile was built for people, not for machines. So if we don't understand what is being people all about or what is HR all about, I think we are wasting our time. Right? So first thing I would like to request all of you to kind of put on a hat for next half an hour at least is you are all responsible for HR issues, whatever your role is. Right? Because if you already go with the mental model that somebody else is going to be responsible for HR issues, you might as well not do Agile. Don't do Agile. I mean, your life is more precious to do Agile. As simple as that. So understand if you don't internalize that, there's no point in doing Agile here, right? That's what I'm going to just rant about for the next half an hour. You've seen, anyone has seen this picture before? Similar stuff, but what is unique about this picture here? Coordination. Coordination. Anything else? Team, okay, anything else? Child wearing a helmet. Child wearing a helmet. Anything else that is right? Like? Somebody is falling here, the person is still able to stand with the other. Thank you, ma'am. Actually, this is a picture of a human pyramid that is falling down. It is not the regular pictures that you see. Most of the pictures are the happy romantic pictures of a well made human pyramid. Very few pictures are there of people falling down. People fall down, they actually get injured and they die as well. And I wanted to show this picture just to get, um, yeah, we didn't have coffee in the morning, but I thought the picture was substitute for that. <laughs> Wake up to all of us, right? Because the key thing is, a lot of times, Agile is exactly like that. What meets the eye is that it is working. So I have a question to all of you. Be honest to yourself and say, how many of you are doing Agile here? You want to raise your hand? And keep your hands up and say, how, many, how, how much of that is working for you? Some 50 percent working for you, okay? 40, 50, yeah. right? In my world, I go, I get called to the organizations, and 90 percent of the organizations I get called to, they started romancing with agile one, two, three, four years back, and they are back to square one with even more resistance back to back to the waterfall way of doing things. Put up uh, whatever agile that they are doing, right? So I have another question: How many of you are doing Scrum here? Okay, I, I, it seems like safe to say about 80% of us are doing Scrum here. If you are doing Scrum there, how many of these organizations still hire managers? <laughs> right, I still continue to see a lot of hands there. Guess what, go to some of the poster child companies that claim that they do Scrum and Agile and look it up on the, on the job boards and LinkedIn, you will find that they routinely hire the industrial era managers. So nothing has changed to be honest. We have got the old wine in a new bottle and that's all, that's, that's the money making racket where I'm talking about here, right? So, I, I want to just talk about some of these things here. Of course, we all know that I'm not going to bore you uh, talking about it. But, let me also make an honest confession. In my work, I go to large corporates. When I show this slide and I ask them how many people have gone to Agile Manifesto, 90% of the people, even in today's time and age, say they have never been to Agile Manifesto.org. So I would request you guys to, if you have not gone to these sites, just go and spend some time because this is what started the whole thing here, right? Now, if I just distill everything there, I can just put it in few slides here. One of the biggest things that 
Agile manifesto doesn't talk about explicitly is that we are actually recognizing that Agile is all about tacit knowledge. In, in the industrial era and in the waterfall style of management, we really talked about explicit knowledge, whereas Agile is really all about tacit knowledge. And tacit knowledge, best way to communicate that is really person-to-person -person communication. And that is the reason why Agile says person-to-person -person communication is the best form of communication, right? There is no altruistic person behind it. There is simple science behind it. The tacit knowledge by definition is something that's really the, the hidden part of it. It's not easy to really capture that in documents. And that's why agilists don't like documentation so much, right? Because uh, how many of you have ever seen in your career documentation in code being in sync with each other? I don't see any hand going up. One of your hands. Right? Then why do you document? How many of you hire people with MA in English literature? The people who can do creative writing or the people who can do documentation. We hire software engineers to do documentation, right? Technical writers. Technical writers, right? So I think these are some of the challenges that we have here. Second thing about Agile is really all about it shifts the focus from a formal communication to more informal, uh, continuous, uh, communication and so on, right? And, and again, stand-up is not something that Agile invented. It's been around for multiple years. Uh, it's just a little more formal way of doing things there. Uh, so, so obviously changing it, we know that. The ownership changes from silos to the team. And that's again a big change uh, because waterfall was really all about, hey, that's my piece of work, that's my code, that's my design, that's my module, that's my document, that's my algorithm, um, that's my database, that's my test, test case and so on. But we have actually taken it away from people and said, hey, there's nothing, no such thing as, uh, you cannot live in silos, but it's really the ownership at the team level. And team, for the first time, became the entity, uh, the, the currency or the vehicle of software development uh, with the giant manifesto, kind of uh, talking about that. The progress itself, instead of making an episodic progress, we are really talking about a more incremental progress here. So we are not saying that, hey, we love making something, uh, something grand at the end of 10 months, but we are saying that every two weeks to four weeks, we want to deliver something of value to the customers. Because we don't believe there is a lot of value in doing that. I always like to talk about one example there. How many of you have heard of a, of a uh, software by name MS Office? Okay. How many percentage features do you use of MS Word? Give me a number. 20, you must be a manager. What percentage? So I mean, Microsoft does actually MS Office 2004, 7, 10, 13, 16 is due this year. They had done 2004 and they came and started asking people what kind of features you would like to have in 2007. And they found they got a lot of feature requests going on and they said, okay, they went through all of them and they found 90% of the features that people asked for were already there in 2004. They had not even discovered it. The shame was that all the engineers in Microsoft MS Office who were building those products were taking three years to get all the requirements, three years for design, three years for requirement. Putting it out at the end of three long years, you pay all the money just to use five or ten percent of the features. Doesn't seem to make a lot of sense there, right? So the key thing is we don't want to make such episodic progress that every three years the state of humanity goes up. We want to make sure that there is a trickle of features. There is a there is a what, what I like to call as a drip feed of features of value to the customers, right? That's that's more uh, helpful. And, and feedback is something that we do really don't want to, we don't love documents, to be honest, right? I mean, how many of you get up in the morning and say, yes, I'm going to write two pages of document today? <laughs> do you know anyone in your team or any of you to like to do that, like get up and do a daily prayer and say, my God, tell me how do I do two pages of documentation well? I don't know anyone like that, right? So the point is we like feedback, but we want to really get the feedback on software. We want to do release all the time. We don't want to write all the time. So that's really the whole agile perspective here. And finally, uh, from when, when it comes to planning, we really want to move away from a very prescriptive to a very adaptive kind of a thing, right? So like the Formula One race, if you have seen, the car can go at 350 kilometers an hour, but that doesn't give the strength. The strength is really being able to adapt to the rapidly evolving situations on the race track. And that's really being agile all about, right? How, do you, how well do you, uh, are you able to adapt to that? So with that, I want to talk about three big uh, themes, and I have one um, uh, slide for each of the uh, points on the theme. I want to talk about people, teams, and culture. 
How are these really getting impacted? What are some of the uh, uh, ideas and perspectives and challenges do we see on that? So the first thing that it does is that for people actually it shifts the focus from me to me. A lot of times we have been in the me situation. Okay, I am there, I am the developer, I am the architect, I am the database guy, I am the test engineer and so on. But we really are shifting the focus when it comes to people from me to me. Now that's a big change in what we have done in the last 50 years. Because our focus was really based on vision goals. Uh, there's only one person from HR, I'm also from half HR, so I'm with you on this. Some of you might have heard of some, have you heard of something known as Redford Job Codes? So what happened in US, they actually, what they did was they took all the professions in the world and they started creating standard job descriptions and then they came up with these job codes. So the most comprehensive one is known as the Redford Job Codes. And can you guess how many job codes are there totally? There are more than 20,000 job codes actually. And pretty much all your job codes are mapped with your, by your parent companies in one of the Redford job codes. Go and walk up to your recruiting uh, or, or uh, uh, team and they will be able to tell you what is your Redford code. Or if you are using a human data or a Mercer data, they would have done an internal mapping to them. Right? The point we are making is that we have created, and this is all over, all industries, all kinds of things here. There are too many pigeon goals we have created actually. Whereas the most effective teams that we are seeing today are the ones that don't care about their individual titles, levels, hierarchy, positions, roles, and so on and so forth. They really talk about how do we really work together as a team. So let's see what are some of the elements in that. The first thing that I think is the most profound idea that has come in the last 15 years is by Carol Dweck. And Carol Dweck came up with this whole notion of fixed versus growth mindset. Anyone has read her book, Mindset? I, okay, I see two hands. I would strongly request, urge uh, all of you to buy that book and please read it. Bill Gates has only put one book on his annual to do to read list, and that is Mindset, as recent as last year. Carol Dweck is a professor at Stanford. She's a professor of psychology, and she has gave, given this beautiful concept of what is a growth mindset actually. And as Stephen King says, uh, talent is cheaper than table salt. What separates the talented and individual from the successful one is a lot of hard work. In the past, we have basically hired people who were learned. The future belongs to the people who are learners. We, to be honest, don't have any role for people who are learned because learned means a fixed mindset. I've already learned whatever was there to learn. I'm the master of everything there. And then maybe I can talk another half a day on mindset alone this slide, but I'll spare you details. But the key thing is, what we are saying is that growth is a much bigger uh, predictor of success than having a fixed mindset. And that's a big change in the organizations that actually embrace agility from the first principles, not from the methods, process, and tools. Agility from methods, process, and tools is wasting your time because you are just taking some new shiny method, process, or tool. 20 years back, I was just reflecting to 20 minutes back to somebody. 20 minutes back, I have seen exactly the same thing playing in this industry, in this very city, when I used to work for companies that went passionately about the CMM, ISO, Six Sigma, and, and so on. And we found that it was the biggest waste of time. Because none of them ever came out with the with the Airbnbs of the world, with the Ubers of the world, with the Facebooks of the world, with the innovations of the world, with the Twitters of the world. All it comes out with an efficiency game. And value creation is not efficiency. Please understand that. Value creation is how do you take the top line up? How do you create, create the next uh, Sunrise products? Not optimizing and tweaking your cost management. That is a CFO's job. Let the CFOs do the job of efficiency and, and tweaking there. Your job is to create value. Right? That's an important distinction here. Skills is an important part. Again, we have been hiring people. Oh, you are a Java programmer? Come, let's, uh, let's talk to you. You are a PHP guy? Let's talk to you. You are a Selenium guy? Let's talk to you. But in reality, in today's world, there is no guarantee about what kind of skill set might be needed to solve the next problem. Like in cricket, there is a special breed of people who are all-rounders. And we have a special breed of people in our teams who are all-rounders. Anyone know what do we call them? So, sorry? Breed full stack. Full stack is a term that has become a little more common there. Game changer. Game changer, okay, I like that. Uh, T-shaped individual or generalizing specialist are some of the terms that we use in the context of Scrum, right? Yeah, exactly. The T-shaped individual or the, or the generalizing specialist. Also, you can call them as all-rounders, 
or or um, the, it, so the, the key idea is that the old hiring that we have done in this industry was purely based on a very vertical narrow set of skills whereas what we are saying is that you, that is not a guarantee for your longevity that is not a guarantee for survival that's not a guarantee for innovation what you need to have is a people's ability to become more t-shaped more cross functional and eventually they are able to adapt to the situations there and that requires building on the mindset that i talked about in the last slide so it builds on that basically the participation itself changes in a big way at an individual level from being drafted we are talking about a voluntary kind of a uh, involvement here what is drafted you get drafted in military right you get drafted that means somebody assigns you and says okay now you go and do that that is being drafted right we have traditionally done in last 40 years in our industry we have drafted people basically because we have created uh, how many of you are guilty of making gantt charts where half the team was only treated as r1 r2 r3 resources <laughs> how many of you are guilty of actually calling your people as resources most of us right but most of us not admitted <laughs> this is a resource because it cannot move by itself move by yourself by themselves they are not resource right so so the point is instead of being drafted we are talking about how we can create a more voluntary form of participation and that is a much more agile way of involving the workforce and building a more engaging workforce there feedback is becoming from a more episodic to a more continuous feedback we are really talking about how we can keep uh, it, it it's like a case of successive approximations that you keep basically keep giving the feedback right when you launch when you launch a satellite to the space you don't launch it and go to sleep and say okay next week we'll come back and we'll give the feedback to the satellite which course it has to take you have the instructions going on every second to that you're basically aligning it you're nudging it right even when it is going to mars or it is going to venus you are kind of aligning that so that's the whole perspective you you are basically giving it all the time this is one of the things that agile community has not woken up to uh, even hr community has not woken up to with all due regards we are still hung up in our and and this is like i'm sure 90% of the organizations here have a career ladder that looks like this after manager you can only become a senior manager after senior manager you can only become uh, uh, a director unless you are in a finance company when you say directly become a senior vp right we have a very funny love hate relationship in our industry with writers right we we all know i mean i have really had people who come up to me and said sir i have not become manager in five years i want to get married right we love writers i don't know what is wrong with us as as a society we we have some problem with that so we are so much in love with the whole notion of linear career path that we don't understand that agility and agile way of doing things is orthogonal to the traditional paths in fact the far better way is really building the career lattice and career lattice is something very kind of a recent kind of a thing i know deloitte is one company which is doing a lot of work in that there are they have been, in fact one of their vps has even written a book on this career lattice very few literature very few company i have not come across more than one or two companies that are actually subconsciously practicing a career lattice but majority of the people are still saying that hey this is how because you are creating pigeon holes and those 20000 red four codes and you are basically saying hey this is how my people have to grow but guess what this is also going to your being agile it is just doing a giant kind of a thing and then you can keep really building on top of it but this is has been built in the over education system or the professional uh, system right from the age basically True. so you cannot change it on the day one it will take some time it will take some you talk about the our education system why we are not able to keep many of the patients coming from here because we are not that focused Yeah. Our kids, when as parent or as a school teacher, you go there. Yeah. You ask your kid to be good in the the uh, sports, good in the uh, so, study. So one more, one more. I agree with you. I totally agree with the spirit of what you are saying. But I am just giving you an opportunity perspective. When I was in Yahoo, I was running the uh, the patent program. This is to talk about patent. I took over the program in 2009. and it was not bad it was a pretty good program we were filing a lot of patents from yahoo in bangalore from 2009 to 2013 i was managing it for 3 3 and a half years the outcome i'm not so talking about the raw output i'm talking about the outcome which is the quality of ip as well in 3 years as as the head of business operation i was nothing has changed there i was able to take it from uh, take it up by 300% that means the number of successful patent filings from bangalore during the time when i was involved in that shot up by 300% that's what i think is been changed from the last couple of 
So the point I'm making is that the talent base is safe, the same organization, the reward structure is safe, but if we believe that there is a different way of addressing the problem, we can change a lot. And it, all it needs is really some gentle nudges. We are not talking about brain surgery. Right? So, so the point I, I, I totally agree with you, but I also believe that it is possible for organizations to actually introspect and find a way and say, hey, these are our blind spots. We are doing something terribly wrong here. Let's go out and change something. Right? So that's just an example here. Okay, let me talk about teams now. Right? Uh, the, the, big, the big idea in teams that we talk about is being from being directed to self-organizing teams. Right? Some of you might have seen pictures like these, a swarm of birds. Right? A swarm of birds doesn't seem to have a leader. It doesn't seem to have anyone di dictating them and telling, guys, let's do this. And they make beautiful uh, patterns in the sky. Right? Now, they don't even know that language, what they are making it. But the key idea is that depending on the situation, depending on what they love doing probably, they are adapting it and they are self-organizing it. Nature is full of stories of self-organization. In fact, there is, a, there is this whole uh, uh, interdisciplinary uh, subject known as biomimicry. And biomimicry is all about learning from Mother Nature, what Mother Nature has already perfected over billions of years. Right? And these are the patterns, these are the things that we are now shamelessly uh, picking up from, from this. I mean, if you go to the website, asknature.org, which has all the kind of answers about what are the design patterns in the nature that we are really learning from. And, and a lot of these ideas are coming to self-organizing when it comes to that. So let's just look at some of the things that, that changes at a team level here. One of the things that changes at the team level is all about the responsibility changes from individual to collective. Right? We don't, we don't, as much as we say, okay, we, we still believe that people are accountable for what they do, but then the overall responsibility is for the team. Now, obviously, if you are going to, uh, to set my goals and reward me based on my individual work, but if you are going to uh, actually measure me for my team goals, then I think there's going to be an orthogonal uh, thing there, right? So, just one random question to, uh, to you. How many of you have change your appraisal system as a part of embracing, adopting or trans transforming to Agile where you have team goals also along with uh, some of the individual goals. Okay, I see less than 5% hands going up. Which itself shows that your Agile is bound to fail sooner or later. Because your people are going to hit the glass wall and they will say, you know what, you expect me to be in a team fashion. You want me to operate like one for all, all for one, team commitment, scrum, planning. But when it comes to the appraisal time, you are still going to make the bell curve, you are still going to do the stack ranking, and you are still going to do the reward based on the manager who is sitting five cubicles away, who has no clue what's happening day in, day out basis in the trenches. There's no feedback coming from the 360 degrees. There is no notion of team goals. All we are saying is, this is the old way of doing appraisals. And that anyway was broken. I mean, we know it for the last 30 years that our appraisal system was broken. I am thankful to companies like Accenture and Adobe and Microsoft and bunch of other companies that finally decided to kill appraisals. Unfortunately, 95% of the industry has not woken up to that. And that's where Agile is going to fail in India big time. I see more problems with uh, MNCs with all due regards. I have, my, I have lived my life in MNCs. The problem with MNCs is that the mothership doesn't want to change and we cannot change it in the India center here. So that's even compounding uh, of the problem here. Service companies have different compulsions there. They anyway have 27 layers of hierarchy which is needed for them to maintain the cost structure. So they are not able to kill that uh, thing because that's the golden goose that lays the golden head. Right? So the only hope I truly honest have are these uh, new age startups that are coming there which are going to the growth phase of 100, 200, 500 people because their genetic uh, system anyway right from the day one is built on some of these ideas here. I spend a lot of time entering startups and I love the energy levels, I love the fact that they have no allegiance to history. They can think free and they can actually do something on a dime which a lot of us cannot even dream to do so. So amazing stuff of learning that's coming from there. But this is one of the big things that happens there because the moment we get into a collective responsibility, we are talking about a very different kind of a mindset. You might have heard of this very famous paper uh, that was written, uh, it's known as the tragedy of the commons. And India, if anything, is tragedy of the commons. Every lake in Bangalore is a tragedy of the commons because commons being the common resources that we talk about. In India, it is orthogonal to our, our, our thinking system. We believe that common means it is not my responsibility. Whereas everywhere in the world, common means it's our collective responsibility. 
and that is one of the agile values here and that's why it has, we have a problem understanding and embracing that. The second one is all about control and the control shifts from process to people driven control. Right? It's an important, it's a big change there because 50 years back, 100 years back when people went to the workforce and people went to factories like Ford production systems, people did not bring the process. The process was already there. People were just plug and play variables in that. Today it's a different world. It is the people who will come and create the process there. So the process is not driving us. People are driving the process. That's again a big change there. Because you are not going to standardize, templatize in a CMM uh, kind of a way of doing things. You are going to let your, like Steve Jobs famously said, we don't hire smart people so that we can tell them what to do. We hire smart people so that they can tell us what to do. And that's a big change again, right? We, we, we need to understand. So people is an important form of control here. The goals move away, as I was telling, from individual to team goals. And as we saw in a random sample, probably less than 5 or 7 percent of the people, and you are just, I'm just not picking on you, you are a representative of the larger Indian uh, software industry. And I believe that less than 10 percent of the industry in India has actually even done something like team goals, for example. And, and that's again a big thing because your agile is bound to fail. People are bound to basically come back and say, no, all this sounds very romantic, it's all good. Guess what? It doesn't work because you are not rewarding me for, if I help you, if Jaya helps me and she takes six hours or four hours out of an evening time and her manager and my manager is same and Jaya says, you know what, I help TV so many uh, times there and you are not even acknowledging it, what motivation Jaya is going to have there. Right now, Jaya is a nice person, I'm sure she will still help. But the point is, these are some of the things that's where it will start to break apart. All structure itself changes from mechanistic to organic. The mechanistic is the, is the term that Max Weber gave many, many, many decades back to talk about a very rigid kind of an organization which remains the same irrespective of how we operate and all, right? Whereas organic is really the flexible kind of a structure that we are talking about. We are talking about how we adapt it. The, do your customers care what, what is your organization structure? No. To some extent, they have to interact with particular senior Maybe, maybe, like for example, I, you, 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 you buy a Dell laptop or an Apple laptop, a laptop or an iPhone or you, you buy a uh, Samsung TV. Do you know what was their own structure? We hardly care. We hardly, we hardly care. That's the point I'm saying. The only person who really cares about your title is your father-in-law. <laughs> Nobody cares. Honestly speaking, nobody cares about your title, your position, the whole structure other than your father-in-law. Whether you are a guy or a girl doesn't matter, it's the same thing, I can assure you. Right? But we also care about titles over here. That's the problem. Because my car says delegate yours as TV. So we accept that if we change it. Okay, so my car says TV actually, it doesn't say anything other than that. So that's all. The title is still there. I take your point. The point I'm saying is, I think titles are the most useless things ever created. There's a beautiful book I would recommend to all of you. I read about 20 years back. The name of the book is Maverick. It's by Ricardo Sembler from Brazil. He's a guy who, he, who took over his father's uh, third largest steel plant in Brazil, Senko. And he, he talked about the whole thing. He said, we never make org structure. And this was like 30 years back. If at all we have to draw an org structure, we draw it on a napkin paper so that we can immediately discard that. The salaries are known to everybody. They were already a radical organization by, by itself. And now we are seeing more and more people are basically doing this. Some of you might have heard of Holacracy. Yeah. Holacracy is a new movement gaming ground actually, which is all about dismantling hi hierarchy, title, people, uh, positions and so on. It's all about making, uh, converting the hierarchy into circles for example. There is a school, there, there, I'm, I'm doing a lot of uh, work on uh, one of the concepts which is very famous in Europe, something known as beyond budgeting. And beyond budgeting is an idea which actually dismantles the whole budgeting process, the whole uh, calendar process, the whole annual planning process. And one of the biggest implementations of Beyond Budgeting is in a company of, uh, of name Stat Oil in Norway. Has anyone heard of Stat Oil? It's a hundred billion dollar company. A hundred billion dollar company that doesn't believe in doing any of the strategic um, jumbo mumbo that we talk about. Right? So these are some of the ideas that are working there. What we need to understand is that these are the organizations who have decided to, under, uh, to uh, challenge how can we make organizations more agile rather than making teams more agile and then we are seeing that uh, it's neither moving the top line nor it is moving the bottom line of the company. So these are some of the ideas there. Kathagar. Sorry. I, yeah. yeah. I, when I was in my school and colleges, we were told that 
Automation is required because you have to move from people to process. Yes. And now we're coming back from process to people. Yes. <laughs> After 20 years. So how do you how do you help us understand that? Yeah, I, I think automation is uh, is great for monotonous, uh, known known kind of problems. Um, something that we understand. For example, if I have to go, if I have to produce 10,000 bottles of uh, this water, uh, the best thing for me is to really create a Gantt chart uh, and use all the sophisticated tools, build a process around it, and do that thing. But if my survival depends on coming up with the next cool, next big thing, then I don't think we can have uh, algorithms or automation really help us. No, no, we, we get it. We, being in the industry, get it. Right. But the implementation of this 20% uh, of uh, IT is around 80% of the world. Yeah. So how do you handle that mindset, you know, from people to process back to people? I don't know whether I've got my question across to you. Okay. <laughs> no, I understand your point of view. Um, it may not be possible for us to find an answer right away. The point I'm saying is, I think we are recognizing that the lights on activities and a lot of work that might need to be automated. Now, Amazon does code push into production every 11.6 seconds, right? We know that. Last five years, they have been talking about it. That process will need automation. Because if you are going to do code push into production every 11.6 seconds, you need an automation. There's no way you can do manually there. But can you come up with an automated way of really coming up with the next cool Twitter, Facebook, Yahoo, LinkedIn, Facebook, Google kind of way product there? I don't believe that's going to happen. Probably around. the adaptability of Agile is less because the fear is more. Yeah. Probably that they really are not able to grapple with the idea of how Yeah. So uh, again, and, and again, when I look at some of the failures, and don't get me wrong, I don't, I don't know if there's anyone from Target here. <laughs> okay, sorry, don't get me wrong. Have you heard of Target Canada? The biggest screw up that happened last year, $7 billion of write-off happened. 200 stores closed down. $7 billion write-off in Target Canada. We are talking about in this, and one of the things that you know, what was the ERP system problem there? The metric systems were in metric versus imperial units. And they didn't know how to really put, somewhere it was inches, somewhere it was centimeters, somewhere it was foot. In today's time and age, people are making dumb mistakes there. Right? Automation is only going to worsen that thing. We haven't even figured out how to solve those problems there. So I think uh, before we go to the automation stage, and again, I, I, I would say that problem solving to me is a fundamentally cognitive activity. It needs people to solve the problem. It needs people to collaborate together. Right. And, and there might be a lot of industries where it can be automated. Uh, if, if I'm doing printing, if I'm making something, I might potentially say a 2D printing, a 3D printing can solve some of these problems there. But software is a fundamentally design problem. Execution problem can be automated, in my view. So if you are making 10,000 BMWs, you can automate that. There is nothing against it, because it's an execution problem. Software is a design problem, and design problem cannot be automated. That's that's how I look at it. But as intelligence and learning systems grow, then there can be a point where design can also get automated by machines. Who knows? I mean, we, we probably are 30, 40 years away from there. I don't believe so. I mean, uh, the whole resurgence of AI that I'm seeing, when I was doing my master's in 89, I, I, I worked on machine learning uh, back in 89. And last 20 years, 25 years, I haven't seen anything happening. So sometimes if you fall in love with some of these new ideas, it will take a lot of time before it becomes mainstream. Some of these will definitely be there. Uh, you should see one of the videos where Harvard actually built 1000 nanobots last year and they put them and they actually create uh, become a pattern there. Things are happening at small scale, there are a lot of lab ideas here, but I don't believe they are just about to invade our daily lives there. So it will, it will still be like many, many decades before it happens. There's one more point I would like to So if you have a bad process, <coughs> Right. If you try to automate that one, you are going to get the bad products pretty faster. Pretty faster. Yeah. So the thing is, you get to change the process, which can give you good product, and then you try to automate. Yeah. So as ultimately, people require to change the process. You make it better. See, process is great in my view when you want to keep the status quo. You want to do it efficiently. You want to do it repeatedly. You want to do it uh, error-free way. That is the great way to automate something there. But if you want, if you thrive, if your uh, success depends on innovation, coming up with new ideas, doing a lot of uh, uh, experimentation, mistakes, and so on and so forth, I don't believe there is one right way of doing it. I think you will need to understand that you will have to do a lot of people pain. Okay, let me just go through and finish the rest of it. So growth, when we see, we move away from perfection to a progress kind of a thing. We believe that there is no such thing as a plan A. In fact, we will never get the first time right especially when we are doing something new there, right? Snapchat has changed, uh, sorry, Snap uh, Deal has changed its business plan six times already. Well, it started out as a Groupon uh, clone, it has ended up more like a uh, marketplace now. 
right? There is no such thing as getting it right the first time. So people will keep changing it, and we there was a lot of time. There was a time in history when we thought uh, those, these were the great uh, innovators, and they they got uh, inspiration in the middle of night, and they built all these beautiful products there. Guess what? Most of them were not Plan A. They were Plan B, Plan C, Plan D. People kept on improving on that till they got to the work that that really works today. So. What is more important than perfection is to really seek progress and keep growing there because that's really going to be a source of bigger value. The culture itself, let's come to the third pillar. The culture is, in my view, from an exclusive to a more egalitarian culture. Right? As we like to say in Agile, there are no second class citizens on an Agile team. Everybody is a first class citizen. Right? And that's the reason why Scrum says everybody is a developer. There are a lot of social psychology experiments done in the 60s and 70s that tell that the fastest way, if I were to make you guys fight, is I draw a line between them, I call this group as developers, this group as testers, and they'll start fighting. <laughs> right? That's the reality. Look it up on Stanford Prison Experiment, look it up on uh, a lot of work that has been done in social psychology. So, so some of this, this is something which uh, we know that, and, and the best teams are the ones that are really not elite or exclusive, but these are egalitarian and equal teams. And that's, that's where I think it, it changes in a big way. So what are some of the changes that happen? Trust, in my view, goes away from top down to a more sideways kind of a trust. Because we might start from, the, our traditional notion of trust is I trust my manager. But now I'm really getting to the point where I'm beginning to trust my team members because we are all joined at the hip. We are all having our common goals working together. And you have to have a deeper level of uh, trust with the, with the team members. And that trust will lead to more of respect. And again, the respect in the olden days for respect was reserved more for people who had more number of years than you, right? Or a bigger cubicle uh, than you. But today we are talking about an unconditional respect to everybody on the floor. That's again a very big thing there, right? Uh, and again, some of the best companies not only do that, they actually they, they demolish the, vis the, vis the visible symbols of power as well, right? For example, uh, most of the companies have gone away from uh, big, cabin, big cabins for managers, right? When I was at Yahoo, all of us, as a VP, as a director, we all sat in open cubicles. When I went to my last company that I worked at 24-7, we had an open office, everybody. We had five VPs sitting on the same floor with, with 200 engineers there. And it didn't matter at all there, right? Because like we, we were on the open plan office there. So I think we are going away from the notion that respect is something which is, is, is only about the symbols of power, um, sim uh, respect to something which is an unconditional part of just being there that has to be there. Transparency is another important uh, uh, value that we talk about as a, as a cultural norm. Uh, we change it from need to know to a default behavior. We don't say that, no, if you need to know, you go and ask somebody. We say that's a default behavior. We believe that transparency is a necessary requirement for everybody to operate with the, with the right intentions. Because if you are not upfront about it, it doesn't matter whether people want it or not. What we are saying is, probably accept one or two things, right? I mean, a lot of companies that I come across now, they are beginning to wake up to the, to, uh, to the idea that, for example, you can walk into any meeting, any, to, any room, any time, except if there is a one-on-one -on -one huddle going on there. What should stop you from walking into any of the meetings? A lot of places I have worked at where there is like, oh, you cannot access these documents. Even though we are, all are getting salary from the same uh, bank account, no, you cannot touch this product's document. You cannot look at them. You have to go up to like four levels above and get the permission for it. Come on. Well, what kind of an age are we living in, right? So, so the whole thing is transparency is going to be more default behavior as we go ahead, right? And finally, the leadership itself is going to move away from, uh, is moving already from a positional to a situational. Like in an operation theater, it doesn't matter who is the chief surgeon. I hope that none of you have ever been in an operation theater before and I hope that none of you ever have to go there because even if you go there under anesthesia you won't know what's really happening there. <laughs> but the key thing is the chief surgeon doesn't, doesn't just throw around their weight there. When it comes to talking about the vitals, they are going to talk to whatever the anesthetist is telling. If they have to talk, and I'm sure all you have all watched those Indian movies or Bollywood movies where like there is this big high tension operation going on and the doctor, they show the camera, the doctor actually just takes out the hand and the nurse uh, passes on some equipment. And the doctor doesn't even say what it is or doesn't check that and straight away uses that there. Right? That actually is a trust. That is a leadership. That head nurse or a head matron 
who may not have the same qualification as a doctor but has been around in the field for 20 years she understands that she knows what exactly is needed there and that's exactly how the doctors behave unfortunately in software industry we don't believe that way right so so that's that's a kind of a thing so the leadership is going to change in a very situational manner where people are going to really depending on whatever is the need of the day depending on what problem we are solving some of these ideas will uh, will happen there right uh, and and eventually the whole thing is really all about learning and learning again from a post facto is going to change more to action it is there because the learning is not just going to be limited to as i said one one time learning but constant cycle of learn and learn relearn and so on so these are some of the ideas that i think are going to be there let me just recap it agile to me is all about people in fact i believe 90% of agile is all about people if you are actually falling in love with your jiras and uh, version ones and rallies of the world you have already wasted your time don't worry about because a fool with the tool is still a fool right we we, we know that thing and because the reason i am telling is 20 years back we had companies after companies coming up when we were going through the level 3 and level 5 uh, process journey they were coming I, i mean i won't name them because of embarrassing them there was this biggest tool maker at that time which actually would come in their marketing brochure would say buy our tools within a within a day you would be level 3 cmm level 3 company that the snake oil was sold to this industry right so don't don't worry about method process or tools it's all about people if you don't trust respect your people software is a much bigger problem i mean forget about agile you are dealing with how can you trust the software that they are going to make them people with growth mindset are the key it's important that you have people who are not fixated with the status quo these are the people who are radicals odd balls challengers rebels call them whatever learn to deal with learn to live with them if these are eccentric geniuses the better we are in your camp then they cross the road and, and open the new next new startup and buy you out in few years right you want them you want those eccentric geniuses because believe me if everybody is doing lights on your company will anyway die john chambers gave a beautiful speech last year in the very god ceo of major a lot of companies and told them and, and told them that in 10 10 years 40% of you will die and that's reality that's going to happen there Uh, so so you cannot just rest on the laurels of what you have done there as as a way as a guarantee for what's going to survive in future self organizing team to establish agility it's important to have a self organizing team a team that is able to really adapt to the situation and find a way to maximize the opportunities might find a way to maximize its ability to deal with the problems solve them and so on inclusive cultures ensure long term cultivation the best cultures that have survived are, are inclusive they are not exclusive we need to understand that we are creating culture inside an organization and that's the difficult part there right and and when you would have seen in terms of talent it's just it, i mean enron had access to some of the best talent there but enron had the most one of the most toxic cultures there and some of you might have even forgotten there was there used to be company of name arthur anderson and arthur anderson was the biggest uh, uh, partner in crime for enron their their best paid people were actually shredding papers as the sec inquiry was going on they were destroying evidence because they were hand in glove uh, in complicity with uh, with people like that so it's important to have the right culture where people feel empowered feel engaged feel free from appraiser reprisal ridicule fear they feel uh, authorized to do something there uh, and, and and so on and so forth there and finally traditional management needs to address these aspects the traditional management in my view is totally um, unfit to basically embrace and and use agile as a transformation tool again agile is not about a software process alone it's a sociological process change it requires this the the matching commensurate changes inside the organization otherwise it will not sustain for a long period of time right so with that i would uh, probably close it i don't know if i have run out of time or not or if i have time for one or two questions i'll let bhai decide that but uh, thanks a lot these were some of the views i thought i'll share here with all of you Two to three minutes. Two to three minutes. Okay. Spoke so much about so much about culture. The question is that uh, there's a struggle right now. We're very honest. We don't know right. where I'm from. But how do you sustain culture? I said. Uh, the reason being that uh, in terms of crisis is when we actually fall back to our old charm, so to say. Right. So how do you do that? Is I think a, I think uh, in my view you sustain culture by cutting off the umbilical cord. you sustain culture by so zappos was trying to change zappos is a billion dollar shoe company that sells shoes and they were embracing bulletproof 
And bureaucracy means no leader, no title, no hierarchy kind of a thing there. 1500 people, they are based out of Las Vegas. 1500 people, uh, Tony Shea said, we are going to adopt uh, this new way of doing things. There was a lot of resistance in the company. Tony Shea quelled the whole thing by saying, all you guys, if you want to walk, if you don't believe in bureaucracy, here is a three month paycheck. You are free to pick it up and walk away from this company. But if you don't pick up this three month severance uh, paycheck, we believe you want to be a part of this organization which believes in creating more egalitarian workspace there. So cut off the umbilical cord. 14% of the people picked up the three months severance pay and walked out of Zappos. They anyway would have walked out. And remaining 86% of the people, they decided to stay there and said, okay, we believe that these are the right values for a workplace. We would like to be a part of this organization. Uh, and again, they will, they, nobody guarantees that it will be a better process. It will go through a bumpy road, but they are trying out something new there. So I believe that cutting off the umbilical cord is to me most important thing. Don't give that option at all, right? And that's what burning the bridges as an English idiom was all about, right? To burn the bridges, so don't allow people to fall back on the default behavior, but encourage them to basically go on and find the solution by themselves. I would look at it this way. The last thing that is, it's always a top down to decide to cut the umbilical cord, isn't it? Because bottom up will be a revolution. What we're trying to do. I'm, I'm not from the top <laughs> level. I'm still a part of. So if I were to tell you, uh, let me add you one more. That this is an Indian example, again an unknown example to most of us here. But there is a company in Mumbai of name Master. Some of you might have heard of it. It's a software services company, 18,000 people company, 30 year old company, hasn't grown like in fees because of the world. But it's a small 18,000 software services company. Go on YouTube, watch Sadhakar Ram's video on Mastech 4.0. Every single thing that I have spoken in the last 40 minutes, Sudhakar Ram as the CEO of Mastec is trying to do for an Indian company as a top-down leadership change. He is trying to build an inclusive uh, leaderless organization, self-organizing teams and so on and so forth. This is the best example I have been able to get so far of a pure Indian grid company which is trying some of these foreign ideas there. I, I, I mean, I wrote to them and I am trying to get more understanding about what they are doing. I wish somebody like uh, Sudhakar Ram comes and talks in a gathering like this because we need to learn from what their experiences there. So I believe a lot of top down is happening. Read up beyond budgeting if you like. Beyond budgeting is all about the senior levels willfully abdicating their responsibility, not ab their titles and leadership in the corner office and saying, we believe the best way to run the organization is turn it over to the people. So there are companies that are beginning to do, but I think. For Indians, it's still going to take some time. Sorry to be selfish. One last question. Uh, uh, let's, let's do the things. We can take it offline. Just, just post it on Twitter with the hashtag. Uh, okay. Everybody, if you have any question, just post it on Twitter. Because we need to follow the time table. Uh, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thanks. Thank you.